You've all heard the saying, better living through modern chemistry. Chlorine is an excellent example of that phrase. But with all the good, there are also risks. Chlorine is the primary chemical used for the sanitation of drinking water, swimming pool disinfection, or in the treatment process of sewage. In the manufacturing world, chlorine is used to treat industrial water and can be found in plastic pipe, pesticides, textiles, solvents, and hundreds of other uses. Gaseous chlorine is a toxic gas with corrosive properties and is one of the most hazardous materials known. Chlorine has a greenish-yellow coloration and is heavier than air, thus tends to settle in lower areas. Chlorine has also been used as a chemical warfare choking agent, succeeding in killing thousands of people more effectively than conventional weapons. The chlorine used today is basically the same chemical. Chlorine is generally shipped to the user in a variety of ways, such as tank cars, one-ton containers, or 150-pound cylinders. Safe handling, storing, and use of this potentially hazardous chemical becomes very important, for if handled improperly, can result in a major event, making the news, causing evacuations, or worse. Training, state-of-the-art chlorine handling equipment, engineering controls, and high-tech instrumentation helps reduce the hazard. But just how hazardous can chlorine be? The EPA reports an average of more than 1,300 chlorine releases each year, resulting in more than 300 injuries and an average of 27 deaths. This data indicates that chlorine is the chemical responsible for more deaths than just about any other product. In most cases, releases were linked directly to a disregard for safety by not following procedures and safety rules or untrained personnel performing tasks that they should not be doing. Certainly, no one starts out the day intending to cause a chlorine release, but from time to time, it's easy to take a shortcut on a job you've done a thousand times before, or maybe, just maybe, take a few liberties with the safety rules. The good news is that if you are properly trained and know and follow the safety rules, the risk of a chlorine release is minimal, but it's up to you to follow the procedures. Okay. Let's talk about some of the risks and hazards associated with chlorine and ways to avoid them. The first place to start is with training. Under no circumstances should anyone be allowed to work with chlorine in any form without full and complete training provided by the organization. The lowest level at which humans can usually smell chlorine and notice its irritant properties generally provides sufficient warning of exposure. However, chronic exposure to chlorine causes changes in the sense of smell, resulting in the inability to smell chlorine and tolerance to its irritant effects. Because of this, people with a history of prolonged exposure to chlorine can lose the ability to realize when they are in the presence of chlorine. A good place to gain an understanding of the properties and hazards of chlorine is with the Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, supplied by your chlorine supplier. Your organization certainly has copies of the data sheets for your review. If not, be sure to contact your chlorine vendor for copies of the MSDS. The MSDS explains the hazards, precautions, and procedures for handling, storing, and using the chlorine. Make a commitment to carefully read and become thoroughly familiar with all the sections of the MSDS as well as your organization's policies and procedures. It's an excellent idea to review the MSDS and your organizational procedures periodically, such as in a group session. This way, everyone has input and is on the same page. If you have any questions, be sure to bring them to your supervisor for clarification. Check the MSDS carefully for incompatible chemicals that might be in your facility. Some organic chemicals react violently with chlorine, often with an explosive force such as acetylene ether, turpentine, ammonia, hydrogen, and finely divided metals and others. Chlorine liquid and gas are non-flammable and non-explosive. However, in the event of a fire, leaking chlorine can support and contribute to the fire. The chemical symbol for chlorine is Cl2. Chlorine is usually shipped in steel cylinders as a compressed liquefied gas. At room temperature, the material is a greenish-yellow gas with a pungent, irritating odor. In the liquid state, chlorine has an amber color. Again, remember, chlorine is heavier than air. 
This is an important point in the event of a leak, as the gas will tend to linger near ground level, so instruments that monitor for chlorine leaks must be located near floor level for that reason. At room temperature, the liquid chlorine converts to a gas and does react with water, therefore water must be kept away from chlorine until it's time to be introduced for the treatment process. If water is allowed to mix with chlorine, it can form hydrochloric acid, which can corrode metals. This is also important to remember, as contact with moist skin, such as the mucous membranes of the eye, nose, throat, and skin in the groin and underarm region can also form the same acid. Compressed chlorine liquid can also cause frostbite and or chemical burns to the eyes and skin. Generally, skin absorption is not a major concern. However, care should be taken to prevent direct skin contact. Should direct skin contact occur, the worker may experience mild to severe symptoms, including irritation, burning pain, inflammation, and blisters. Severe chemical burns may result in tissue damage. If exposed to chlorine, flush the affected parts for at least 15 minutes with flowing water before transporting to medical care. This is important, as failure to do so will result in continual damage en route to the hospital. Inhalation is the main and most dangerous route of chlorine gas exposure. Respiratory system exposure can progress, causing severe lung damage and even death. Mild to moderate exposure results in rapid onset of eye, nose, and throat irritation, coughing spasms and choking sensation, vomiting, hoarseness, or complete loss of the voice. Narrowing of the airway is an early and prominent effect of exposure, as the victim often describes the sensation of feeling suffocation. Signs and symptoms of accumulation of fluid in the lungs, also known as pulmonary edema, may appear within several hours of exposure. Sudden death can occur due to the narrowing of the upper airway, resulting in difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath. The majority of chlorine exposure-related deaths occur within 24 hours of exposure and is generally due to respiratory system failure. It is important to know that respiratory symptoms may be immediate or delayed for several hours or days after exposure. This is why it is imperative that the victim is seen by a physician following exposure. There could be no exceptions as they could die while at home. First aid consists of removing the victim to fresh air and keeping the victim warm and quiet, remove contaminated clothing, and get to a hospital at once. Of course, CPR would be required in the event the victim stops breathing. Again, always seek medical treatment after any exposure, no exceptions. Even a small dose of chlorine can be deadly. Since chlorine is a gas at room temperature, ingestion is an unlikely route of exposure. However, in the event that you were to accidentally swallow chlorine, you would likely receive severe burns to the mouth, throat, and stomach. This is why it's so important to never put chemicals into items such as bottles, cans, coffee cups, and such. Doing so would make it far too easy to accidentally ingest toxic chemicals. Serious burns to the eyes are also potential hazards, so it goes without saying, that eye protection such as chemical rated goggles and face shields are a must. Without going into what, how much, and other frightening things about chlorine, let's just say it requires a constant effort on your part to refresh your training, prevent spills, leaks, injuries, and emergencies. Due to the very cold or cryogenic nature of chlorine, if splashed on your skin, a frostbite injury could occur. Chlorine also reacts violently with oil and grease, creating the potential of spontaneous combustion. So be sure to store oil and grease well away from chlorine. This includes grease or oil on your clothing as well. It's important to know that spilled chlorine expands very rapidly. For example, if you were to spill one tablespoon of chlorine in a room, the liquid would quickly vaporize and expand into more than 450 cubic inches of chlorine gas, making a release of gas a major concern. Containers of chlorine are generally lifted using hoists, such as overhead pendant hoists. Safety shoes are a must in this operation, as would be hard hats if the container needed to be raised above the head. 
If transporting containers on trucks, do so only if properly secured along with the required DOT signage. We can all agree that chlorine must always be transported with the load properly secured to prevent rolling off. If handling 150-pound cylinders, always do so secured to a dolly or cart. Never spin or roll these cylinders, for if one was to get away from you, it might fall and result in a chlorine release. Of course, be sure that the valve cap is securely in place. The same goes for one-ton containers. Handle with special lifting equipment, such as a pendant hoist with a lifting rail. Be sure to protect valves and fusible plugs with the protective container caps and secure the containers or cylinders with chains or straps to prevent accidental movement. When there is potential for direct exposure to chlorine, an air-supplied respirator or self-contained breathing apparatus with a skate bottle is necessary. Of course, training in the use of this respiratory protection, as well as employee medical evaluations and fit testing would be required. Many progressive safety-minded organizations have installed chlorine scrubber systems in the event of a chlorine leak. The scrubber system is activated by the chlorine detection system, capturing and making the escaped chlorine inert. Always follow your organization's procedures when entering a chlorine area and make sure the monitoring systems, ventilation, and scrubber systems are functioning properly. Of course, use only the proper respiratory protection and other PPE when making any repairs, performing service, or fixing leaks. It's also important to have a standby person ready to assist in an emergency. When conducting tasks such as system maintenance and container changeouts, one important point to remember is to always change out the washer regardless of the condition of the old one. If using lead washers, be sure to properly dispose of any product containing lead and wash your hands when done. Again, it's important to never work alone with chlorine. Always be sure at least one emergency standby is there at all times. When working with chlorine, use only those tools and procedures approved by the Chlorine Institute. Check for leaks after the cylinder connection has been made using bombate of ammonia solution on all connections. The ammonia reacts with any escaping chlorine, creating a white cloud indicating a leak. Certainly, if you do observe a leak, follow your organization's leak repair procedures. If you cannot stop the leak immediately, notify your supervisor and follow the established emergency action procedures. Approach a leak only if thoroughly trained and when wearing appropriate respiratory and eye protection and protective clothing such as level A suits, gloves, or other necessary safety equipment. Leak repair kits such as A, B, and C kits must be readily available to handle the leak. The A kit contains the equipment and parts to repair a leak in a 150-pound cylinder. The B kit is for one-ton cylinders and the C kit is for tank cars. It's important to periodically inspect each kit and verify that all the equipment required for that kit is still there as it's not unheard of for critical parts such as wrenches, gaskets, and plugs to be missing when needed. Practice enough with the equipment to ensure that you're comfortable with the leak repair procedure. Consider erecting a wind sock as a visual indicator of prevailing wind direction in the event of a leak. Wind direction is critical to know as evacuating personnel can take advantage of the wind direction to help evacuate in a safe manner. Be sure to practice emergency evacuation plans and procedures periodically to ensure that everyone, including vendors and contractors, know how to quickly and safely evacuate the facility. Training and more training is needed to be highly skilled in leak repair and it's a great idea to drill with your local fire department or local chemical emergency team so they are also knowledgeable of your operations and techniques. Leaks typically occur at valve packings, fusible plugs, pigtails, and defective valves. Normally, you can probably handle most leaks, but it is a good idea to notify the fire department and the local hazardous materials response team for help and assistance if there is any question as to the size and serious nature of the leak. Better safe than sorry. Contingency and chlorine emergency plans are essential for all organizations using chlorine. Review your plan often and update it and practice frequently. 
Remember, never attempt to repair a leak by yourself. Always have someone assist you or at least have a trained standby for assistance. Generally, federal, state, fire, and building codes regulate chemical emergency preparedness and response activities relating to chlorine releases. All persons handling or responsible for the handling of chlorine must be familiar with the requirements. The Chlorine Emergency Plan, also known as CHLORAP, is an industry-wide program formalized by the Chlorine Institute in 1972. The program is designed to improve the speed and effectiveness of response to chlorine emergencies. Trained emergency teams from chlorine producing, packaging, and consuming organizations are on 24-hour, 7-day alert to assist in handling potential or actual chlorine emergencies. During a chlorine emergency, basic emergency information and advice will be provided and each organization put in contact with the closest Chlorep team for assistance. The Chlorep telephone number is 1-800-424-9300. Be sure to verify the number from time to time to ensure that it has not been changed. The call is toll free, so don't hesitate to call. You're the professionals, so be prepared and follow your training and organization's policies and procedures. Never take shortcuts and take the time for safety because chlorine can be dangerous. One last thing before we leave this important subject. Chlorine or its derivatives can be a threat in your home also. Mixtures of liquid household cleaner, chlorine bleach, and ammonia can produce a very toxic chlorine-based gas. Sodium hypochlorite solution or chlorine bleach when mixed with an acid such as toilet bowl cleaner can also release chlorine gas. There have been numerous accidental injuries and deaths associated with improper mixing of household or custodial cleaners. The moral of the story is to follow the directions on all cleaners and household chemicals and never mix them and be sure there is adequate ventilation. In a nutshell, that's about it. Another program to help you be more aware of the hazards you may face and ways to prevent an accident. You're the professional. You work with chlorine on a daily basis and you probably have much more knowledge and training than was presented here. But the point we're trying to make in this short program is one of awareness. Reinforcing the importance of following safety rules, not taking shortcuts, and of course, taking the time to work safely. Thank you.